there we go okay we'll just let everybody in and then we'll go through the rules of engagement should i stop video no because you have to have yours on just now when you're presenting okay, <laughs> okay so the attendee rules of engagement. This webinar is being recorded. No one can see that you're attending unless you'd like to ask questions. So if you'd like anonymity during the question and answers, please tick the box to send anonymously before sending your question. You may ask the question at any point during these presentations, but they'll be answered after all the talks. If we don't get through your questions in the allocated time, which is one hour for this evening's webinar, we will answer them via email after the session. The agenda for tonight, I'll be doing a quick welcome. Dr. Tato Mayoto from Femicare Fertility is gonna be talking about what to expect when you're expecting during these times. Sister Bronwyn Rousseau from NetSales will be talking about stem cell banking. And Dr. Serena H. Chen via video will be talking to us about the COVID-19 vaccine whilst pregnant and trying to conceive. And then we'll have the question and answer session. Okay, so thank you to everyone for joining us on our fourth webinar for Reproductive Health Month 2021. My name is Saskia Williams and I'm the founding director and CEO of IFASA. I'm proud to be bringing this Reproductive Health Month campaign and these webinars to you in association with Ms. Michelle and Lutzia of House of Fertility Media, as well as the IVF Babel Africa team. We are bringing you webinars every Tuesday and Thursday evening throughout February, featuring local and international specialists and speakers. So who's up first tonight? Our first speaker is Dr. Tato Mayoto. Dr. Tato is from Femicare Fertility Clinic and Advanced Endoscopic Surgery Center and is a registered obstetrician and gynecologist with a keen interest in reproductive medicine and a fertility fellow at the University of Pretoria. Over to you, Dr. Tato. Uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Let uh, me try... Uh, to share my screen. This is this is always nerve wracking for me, to be honest. I always feel like something might go wrong. Am oh, I perfect? Yes. Ah, yes. The ancestors are with us today. So I know that everybody who is uh, watching this is, uh, might be a bit tired of hearing about COVID-19. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like COVID is going to be with us at least for the foreseeable future. And fortunately or unfortunately for our pregnant uh, uh, women out there, um, you are, unfortunately are not that special when it comes to COVID-19. And you'll see why I say that at the end of this presentation. So just a little bit of technicalities and background. Um, COVID-19 um, is actually formed by uh, SARS uh, COVID 2 virus, um, which is an RNA enveloped uh, virus, which um, actually enters your um, uh, host cells by uh, use of your um, angiotensin converting enzyme receptors. And it can have multiple effects um, on your um, on the host cells. So it has direct cytotoxic effects, it can dysregulate your um, renin angiotensin system, and it also causes endothelial damage and thromboinflammation, which increases your DVT. Now we know that it is a multi-system disease, so it can affect every system in your body, including the skin, and it manifests itself um, um, in all the systems according to um, the severity of the disease. So we'll be jumping back and forth uh, between its effects on pregnancy and vice versa. So we know that uh, pregnancy uh, increases your, sorry. Okay, going backwards. So we know that in pregnancy, um, the, the, the pregnant mother has increased susceptibility to infections in general but especially uh, your respiratory infections. And we also know that there are physiological changes that happen in pregnancy to especially your respiratory system, but to the rest of your body, 
um, that uh, can also worsen the condition of COVID-19. Another thing is that pregnancy is a relative immunosuppressive state. So to maintain the pregnancy, um, your, your body sort of goes into a semi-immunosuppression um, because it has this foreign body that it has to maintain. So the limited evidence that we know in the past 18 months or so is that COVID-19 is transmitted mostly through uh, direct contact uh, with respiratory droplets uh, uh, being uh, a major uh, form of transmission. The limited data that we have shows no vertical transmission, which means the mother cannot give the baby in utero COVID-19. However, once the baby is born, the baby is still at risk of, of, of getting uh, COVID-19 from direct contact with the mother, excuse me. Now, the epidemiology that we have for the pregnant population seems to be very similar to the general population. There was a, a study that was done um, that showed, it was actually a study that was done in middle to high income countries that tested every pregnant woman or recently pregnant woman that attended, uh, that went to, to a hospital. And it showed um, a rate as high as one in 10 pregnant women being positive for COVID-19. However, three quarters of them were asymptomatic. We know that the mortality rate, and that's in keeping with our own mortality rate uh, in the general population, is about 2%. How women present uh, in pregnancy is similar to the general population with fever and cough still being uh, the most common uh, symptom that women complain about, that pregnant women complain about. And that is no different from the general population again. Now, we know that uh, there are different classifications that, it, when, that, that, that we speak of when it comes to the severity of COVID-19. So the majority of women will still present as asymptomatic or mild to moderate disease. And very few women will have severe or critical COVID-19. So what should we do when it comes to antenatal care? So we know the rules of COVID-19. I'm sure most of you will be uh, waiting uh, to watch uh, the big family meeting at seven o'clock. And I think these will still be drummed into the rest of, um, to the rest of us. So we still need to observe social distancing. We need to follow self-isolation guide, um, uh, guidance if need be and hand hygiene. There was um, an, interest, an interesting recommendation um, that was released by the Department of Health. I think some of it uh, might be a little outdated, but most of it still holds water. And it says that uh, in patients, or rather in this pandemic time, we should minimize in-person visits. We should consider telephone or video conferencing as part of the antenatal care system. And if a woman is pregnant and symptomatic, they should test and self quarantine. But I am going to go through a more thorough way of looking at a pregnant woman later on. Obviously, if symptoms persist or they are um, quite sick, so uh, severe or critical, then they should be hospitalized. And um, this is a major form of uh, anxiety and depression for most pregnant women. And that if they're asked, uh, uh, admitted into hospital, they are usually have to self-quarantine, which can be quite distressing to them. And for pregnant women who have recovered, um, there is data which is lacking um, on the potential development of intrauterine growth restriction or placental insufficiency. However, the department still um, advocates for close follow-up with fetal growth cans and fetal well-being depending on the findings post recovery. Now, when it comes to antenatal care and ultrasound, this is a little bit of background. So we know that the WHO and um, most societies actually recommend a minimum of 
uh, two uh, scans in, in, in high, middle to high income countries. And the first scan is your gestational or your dating sauna. And then you usually have an anatomy scan between 18 and 22 weeks. Now, there have been plenty of studies that have shown that other scans don't actually improve the neonatal outcomes. However, they improve the, the mother's experience and improve um, her, her follow-up. Um, and of importance is that it is different in high-risk pregnancy. So say, for example, commonly in our setting, a lot of women struggle with preeclampsia. So if you have preeclampsia, it means that you will have more visits and you will have more growth scans of your baby because part of the disease actually affects your baby. So it depends uh, on, on, on your risk profile, how many ultrasounds you need and how many doctor's visits you need. So the recent, um, and this has changed recently, the South African guidelines have increased the antenatal care um, visits um, to a minimum now of eight. And the majority of the additions were added in the third trimester because of um, our struggles with um, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. So we know that COVID-19 um, um, affects the mother. Uh, and as I said, the majority of women are asymptomatic or mild to moderate symptoms. Uh, however, if one gets um, uh, uh, COVID-19, there is some evidence that suggests that they are at higher risk for requirement of ventilatory support. And we know that pregnant women already have a risk of, of, of having uh, DVTs or, or venous thrombotic effect, uh, events. Uh, so that coupled with the COVID-19, which also affects um, or increases your chances of having um, um, deep vein thrombosis, um, uh, exponentially increases those chances. So uh, we need to consider giving uh, pregnant women um, clexane. And in fact, the Royal College suggests that if a woman is hospitalized for COVID-19, they should be on prophylactic um, low molecular weight heparin, which is clexane. When it comes to uh, maternal death risk, as I said, uh, the maternal mortality the evidence currently still suggests um, that uh, the mortality rate is comparable to the general population, which sits at about 2% of pregnant women in our setting. Now, there has been a lot of um, worry and um, discussion concerning whether COVID-19 causes preterm delivery and in turn increases the neonatal morbidity, which is uh, um, the state of how your baby is born. So um, there have been a few studies that showed that there were high rates of preterm delivery. And the majority of those preterm delivery was as a result of the maternal reason. So it's the doctor saying that they are going to terminate the pregnancy because the mother is too sick. However, recent, recently, um, there was a, a study that showed that included the overall population because those initial studies, on, uh, studies only included patients who were hospitalized, which meant that they were sicker than the general population. So um, that new study actually um, showed that uh, the preterm delivery rate overall is 15%. But um, it was quite a poor quality study, so I'm not sure how, uh, how great how that data um, can be used in our setting. Um, now, there is insufficient evidence to determine any correlation, direct causality between COVID-19 infection and spontaneous preterm labor. So for now, as things stand, COVID-19 do not, does not cause spontaneous preterm labor. Now we have to keep in mind that there are certain things, certain symptoms that are associated with COVID-19, for example, a high fever that might and that may cause uh, spontaneous preterm labor. COVID-19 does not uh, cause chromosomal or structural abnormalities to the fetus. 
and it has not been found to increase the rate of miscarriage or early pregnancy loss. As I said, there is no evidence for vertical transmission and the mode of delivery um, uh, is not dependent on, on your status on whether you have COVID-19 or not. Now, also when it comes to uh, COVID-19 correlating to your cesarean section rates, initially there were studies that showed quite high cesarean section rates. Again, this was looking at patients who were in hospital, which meant that they were uh, severe uh, disease. And in those patients, um, the, the treating medical doctors um, found it necessary to do cesarean section rates. So we cannot extrapolate those cesarean section rates to the overall COVID-19 pregnant um, population. Uh, so chances are that the caesar rates would be lower when we look at the overall population. So there is no data currently for mild to moderate disease. The criteria for diagnosis and treatment is as for general population. We know that you need a PCR to diagnose and uh, to start treatment. And sometimes, you know, with a 70% sensitivity, if the patient tests positive and clinically the patient looks like they have COVID-19, then you can still retest the patient after a negative swab. Now, there are different management principles, and I'm just going to be dealing with the principles uh, from a general point of view. There are, there's a, a, a principle that um, I think has, has, has uh, sort of um, taken a backseat in, in obstetrics called uh, BIBO. And BIBO does not um, uh, stand for, um, it's, it's not a, a famous Zambia song. I think there was a Zambia song called BIBO. But uh, it actually stands for better in, better out. So what we obs as obstetricians were taught was that you prioritize the mother. So that's your primary patient. And secondary patient is the baby. So you always ask yourself in any clinical scenario, is, it, is the baby better in or better out for the mother primarily? Or is the baby better in or better out for the baby? So that might mean quite difficult um, uh, uh, decisions that need to be made. So for example, if a patient is pregnant, comes in with quite severe disease, and clinically we think terminating the pregnancy will improve the mother's condition, then uh, the decision should be made to terminate that pregnancy irrespective of the baby or the pregnancy's gestational age. Now, we've spoken a little about this, and the Royal College previously and uh, quite popularly has come up with uh, a venous thromboembolic risk assessment, specifically in general, but also for pregnant women. So that still holds water for here, so you should individualize patients. But as I said, the Royal College still said, uh, I recommend that all pregnant women who have COVID and need hospitalization should at the very least be on clexane prophylaxis, unless um, the birth is expected within 12 hours. Now, they, there has been some controversy uh, when it comes to corticosteroid use, uh, whether uh, if a patient needs steroids for the COVID-19, will it, uh, or, or rather whether the, the, the mother needs or the baby needs corticosteroids, will it worsen the COVID-19? There's no evidence um, that giving steroids for fetal maturity in COVID-19 infection causes harm to the mother. So there should not be any change in routine clinical practice. So if the baby needs steroids, you give steroids. Now, if the mother is infected and comes in preterm labor, and I think this is a little outdated because it, uh, it, it depends on how the mother is clinically. But the National Department of Health South African guidelines, which were published um, last year, April 2020, said that there is no need for tocolysis. Um, so you should, if a woman comes in preterm labor, you should let them deliver. You should give steroids then, but let them deliver and not tocolize for the, uh, uh, for the sake of giving steroids. 
but I think that is a little outdated. And, and my suggestion is that every patient should be individualized and the clinician should make a decision on how the patient is. Now, labor and delivery is, 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 can be quite a lonely time for uh, as our uh, pregnant women. Because if you are COVID-19 positive and you are delivering, it means that the support that is nece necessary and, and usual, can, you can no longer get um, in that setting. But we know that COVID-19 is not an indication to delivery and it is not an indication for cesarean section. There is a place for assisted delivery when there's maternal exhaustion and respiratory distress. And that is, we know is one of the indications for assisted delivery anyway. So it has nothing to do with COVID-19. It is secondary to that. All patients should be delivered in an isolation room. And the suggestion is where possible, the staff that is involved in delivering that patient should ideally not be involved in the management of other pregnant women in the same shift who are COVID negative. The mode of delivery does not add any more risk to the mother or fetus. So you will only do a cesarean section for obstetric reasons. Remember the important thing, and I've been involved in a few of these deliveries and they can be quite um, difficult and cumbersome, especially for the healthcare professionals. Uh, but the, for the mother, usually it does not um, uh, change too much. Um, so you still adhere to the uh, precautions uh, that um, include PPE. Now, there are no studies that recommend additional fetal monitoring for asymptomatic women, but currently the guidelines is that you do a continuous CTG for symptomatic patients in labor. And obviously you should minimize uh, um, staff um, to reduce the risk or the number of people who are at risk of getting COVID. And if the patient is symptomatic, you, they must deliver in, a, in a, a, a hospital. So in a place that can provide emergency obstetric, anesthetic and neonatal care. And this delivery equipment um, that is usually um, specific um, to us, the healthcare professionals. Now, when it comes to breastfeeding, the virus is not in breast milk. Um, that's the limited studies that we know. However, we know that close contact is a risk for the baby getting COVID-19. However, the current guidelines, and this is still the suggestion, is that if you wish to breastfeed, the benefits of breastfeeding still outweigh the risks. However, you can choose to express, um, but if you still want to breastfeed, um, the guidelines say that you should stay at least one meter away from, the, from your baby until the baby needs to breastfeed. And precautions should still be taken at all times to limit viral spread to the baby. And that includes um, um, hand hygiene. So I am a, a big fan of, of uh, algorithms because they, they simplify things. Um, so this is um, an American Journal of Emergency Medicine um, algorithm, which just highlights um, how, where to go if you are faced with a COVID-19 positive pregnant woman. So if the patient is mild or moderate, um, and so there's no, no pneumonia and with normal, normal patient, and if there's no risk factors for decompensation, that patient can be treated at home. If there are risk factors for decompensation, which means comorbid illness, so those are high risk patients, you should consider admission. However, in patients with severe or critical disease, those patients should obviously be admitted and will probably need um, um, intensive care, at the very least, high care or intensive care. And this, um, just highlights again the principles uh, which we have gone through um, and the management is determined by the severity of the disease. Um, the talk did not focus too much on the specific management uh, because I, I, I don't think uh, we had enough time to delve into the 
especially the immune and parasitic drugs um, that we didn't get into. Now, this is, this is quite an important slide because I think this is a forgotten, uh, it's a forgotten um, part of a woman's health, the mental health. So there are multiple studies and in, with each of these um, um, signs, with each of these signs, there have been studies that have shown that you get increased social isolation, anxiety, depression, there's an increase in domestic violence, especially in our setting in abusive relationships. Um, so the woman's mental health is not always at its best um, when it, uh, it should be, uh, because it's supposed to be a happy time for the mother. And unfortunately, um, it is not always. So we should always use our antenatal visits as an opportunity to assess at-risk women. So ideally, if a woman in our setting now, a woman who is undergoing antenatal care should still follow the antenatal care schedule following COVID-19 uh, protocols. If the woman is positive, you can, um, you can um, uh, defer a few antenatal visits until their um, isolation or quarantine, 10-day uh, quarantine is over. So that's about 10 days, so it shouldn't take too long. So the take-home message is, you know that COVID-19 is a potentially deadly infection. However, there's limited data on the pregnant population. So ideally, the pregnant population should be treated as per normal. And in those, in our setting, the mother is always a primary patient. We always look out for the mother first before we look out for the baby. Follow the obstetric principles. If you follow the obstetric principles, you will not go wrong. And always remember that uh, us as obstetricians and gynecologists are not alone in this treatment. And there's a multidisciplinary team that um, needs to be involved in our COVID positive patients, especially looking at our intensive, intensivist um, internal medicine, um, our psychologists um, that we need. Thank you. I think that's it. Perfect, Dr. Tato, thank you very much. Um, there are some questions to go through, but we'll do that at the end of the presentations. Um, okay, great. Next speaker is Sister Bronwyn Rousseau. Sister Rousseau is the Net Cells Medical Officer and will be talking to us about stem cell banking. Okay. okay. Dr. Uh, Tartu, if you unshare, then they're perfect. Excellent. Mr. Rousseau, can you, can you share? Yep, there we go. Trying to get into my slideshow. <laughs> You're in. If you go to the top, yeah. Okay. Hi, Perfect. good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation to share the exciting um, science of stem cell. Uh, umbilical cord blood and tissue banking. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to continue. All right, so what is cord blood? Now cord blood is rich in blood forming stem cells that can be used to treat over 80 blood related diseases, including bone marrow cancers, for example, a leukemia or a lymphoma, anemias such as a sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, Fanconi's, Fanconi's anemia, and an aplastic anemia. We can use uh, cord blood uh, stem cells to treat an immune deficiency syndromes and inborn errors of the metabolism. The cord blood is a very valuable source of stem cells for bone marrow regeneration. And it is an alternative source of uh, stem cells for a bone marrow transplant. So they are nice, healthy young stem cells um, as opposed to uh, bone marrow stem cells that have sort of lived the life of the donor. All right, so the cord blood is collected immediately after the baby's born. 
Okay, so the doctor or the obstetrician or midwife will safely deliver baby. The cord is clamped and cut, and then a little needle is uh, placed into the vein on the side of the placenta, uh, of the side of the cord that is still um, attached to the placenta, which still needs to be burst. Um, and then the cord blood is collected like, uh, like you're donating blood. All right, and then um, the cord, uh, uh, this collection is done very, very quickly. It's safe and it's painless. It doesn't prolong the delivery um, and it doesn't lead to increased um, uh, bleeding, particularly at a Caesar. Um, that's a little bit of a misconception. Internationally, cord blood is being researched for the potential treatments of a lot of diseases, um, cerebral palsy, brain injuries, strokes, autism, and autoimmune diseases. All right, and then we can also derive stem cells from the cord tissue. And the cord tissue is that which is, makes up the, the, the umbilical cord, which sort of then houses the, those, those uh, lovely blood vessels that feed the baby. All right, and the cord tissue contains mesenchymal stem cells, and which are stem cells that give rise to connective tissue of the body. So for example, the skin, muscle, bone, cartilage, nerve, and fat. Cord tissue is then collected after the cord blood has been collected and the placenta has been delivered. A little piece about 10 to 15 centimeters of the cord is cut, wiped clean and placed into a sterile container. This, and this tissue contains these unique stem cells that are capable of differentiating into many different types of cells as well. And they also have enormous anti-inflammatory properties. There are a number of clinical trials around the world studying the uses of mesenchymal stem cells for a variety of aesthetic and medical conditions. Okay, um, the aesthetic condition is to help plump up the skin even. <laughs> and uh, there's some, some evidence to show that they, they're using it in research in, in hair regrowth, which is very exciting. Um, skeletal injuries, um, including bone, cartilage, muscle, tendon, and ligament repair. Um, as mentioned earlier, autoimmune disease, heart and vascular disease, gastrointestinal disease, neurological diseases and sport, uh, spinal cord injury and wound healing. All right, so who can use these wonderful valuable stem cells? Now the donor or the little person from whom uh, cord we are taking the, the um, cord blood from, those stem cells bill will be 100% match to the, your baby, to the owner. All right, and there is a 25% chance of them matching for a sibling, and that goes out exponentially. So for parents, there would possibly be like a 12.5% or one in eight chance of um, the stem cells being a match. Okay, so why do you consider banking these stem cells? All right, so to date, there's been over about 40,000 cord blood stem cell transplants. Okay, currently there's only one in 100,000 chance of finding bone marrow stem cell donor that will match. The chance of patients of mixed descent have a one in 400,000 chance of finding a match. The cost of searching for a matching donor can be a financial challenge for most families, with a minimum cost of this being over 25,000 rand, uh, 250,000 rand. The stem cells in the cord blood or cord tissue are more naive than other sources of stem cells, that in the bone marrow or even in peripheral blood, as they have more potential to be manipulated and have enormous regenerative potential as opposed to other sources or older sources of stem cells. As the stem cells are more naive, the cord blood stem cells have a lower risk of graft, graft versus host disease. Okay, because they belong to you um, and there's very little risk of, of rejection. All right, and if you have a, um, a, a donation of, of cord blood as, you know, from a, a donor, you will only need a four out of six match on tissue markers um, if you use cord blood samples, as opposed to um, with bone marrow and peripheral blood, there is a need of a six out of six match. All right. There are limitations. And um, the unfortunate limitation is that if, if we have a, a, um, genetic, a genetically inherited disorder, the stem cells that have been collected for the little one that is affected by this disorder cannot be used to treat the disorder because they have that same genetic um, 
makeup and it, it, it would be, uh, you know, it would not help the little one to do so. But that little somebody could potentially get stem cell donation from a sibling. And as we said, there's that 25% chance that they could match. All right. But let's say, for example, that very same child with a genetic disorder has a brain injury. Those stem cells could be, his own stem cells could be used to assist with a brain injury, but would not be able to treat the genetic disorder. All right. And then the volume of blood collected from cord blood is lower than other sources, as the other sources we mentioned, bone marrow or peripheral blood. Okay. And therefore, the cell count sort of per milliliter of blood will be lower. Okay, so a decent collection is, is imperative um, to, to allow to treat a child of about 40 kilograms. Okay, and the reason we say, and, and the amount of volume we say is a decent um, collection should be ideally between sort of 60 to 100 milliliters. will yield a good sample that will then be um, acceptable for use in transplant. All right, so this unfortunately does come at a cost. All right, and we have our stem cell banking does do, um, we do uh, different types of, well, there's two options really. So we can do cord blood banking only, or um, what a majority of our, our moms and dads do is they do the blood and tissue banking. All right, on this slide is listed the, the breakdown in the pricing. So we do have a non-refundable registration fee, which covers the administrative cost as well as the cost of the collection kit. All right, and the collection kit will then include um, the bag that which the blood goes into, the little um, test tube, if you like, where the cord tissue goes into. There are um, maternal blood tests that need to be done, and that will include that process. All right. Um, Oh, no, Allah, sorry. <laughs> the processing fee then includes that of, of the, the maternal blood testing. All right. Um, and then uh, we have storage options. So now the storage options, we either can store for 20, uh, 10 years with an option of toward the end of that storage period to then extend it for another 10 years or five years or, you know, or whatever happens at the time. Or you can sign up for a 20-year storage um, option. And then your payments then would be worked out, um, these various options to pay. So we can pay either the full amount um, up front, we can pay at, um, you know, on a successful storage. So there's various options that, that you could choose. And we do have payment plans, which are interest fee, but there is a 86 rand um, a month admin fee. All right, um, just a note on the 20 year storage, it doesn't mean that's how long your stem cells last. Okay, it's just a parameter that we, we have set, but there is evidence to say that we can, um, you know, successfully store and use stem cells that have been cryogenically frozen for um, over 23 years. All right, so if you would like to go ahead and do your stem cell storage, we have an online registration system. And then you can do an online registration, do your registration fee payment. We will deliver, deliver the collection kit to you within three to five working days after you've done your registration. You would need to just take this collection kit with you to the hospital. But if you forget it at home, it's not a crisis because all the, the maternity units um, in, in the metropolitan areas and even outlying areas in, in, in South Africa have got collection kits in their labor wards. All right, you just need to ask your midwife just to get the net sales box off the shelf <laughs> out of the storeroom. Okay, then um, we ask that the, the blood test, the tubes that are, are in the little boxy, they are for certain types of infections to test. Okay, so we do test um, for HIV, hepatitis B and C, um, syphilis, something called cytomegalovirus, and another um, virus called um, HTLV1 and 2. Okay, so they just um, they are directed uh, to us by the International Board of Blood Banks, which we do to have to get those results. And we do ask that those blood tests are done before baby is born, um, so as to avoid um, something called hemodilution. So sometimes during the labor and delivery, moms have a lot of uh, intravenous fluid, and that can dilute those bloods and the results may not be very accurate. All right, um, at the birth, as we said, the doctor, your gynae or your midwife will do your collection. Um, we will ensure that you are well in, um, versed on, on the whole sort of packaging um, 
process and how to fill in all the documents. We send you a little video on how to pack the box and make sure it's all done. Our client services team will talk you through uh, the packaging and ensure that all your documents are completed telephonically. Um, and then, and, and how do we know that your baby's born is we do ask you to please phone the telephone number that is on the box. And then um, we will kickstart the process and then arrange for the box to be collected. The stem cells are processed, cryogenically frozen and stored in our state of art storage tanks. You will then receive an email of your results certificate. A storage certificate will be issued to you once full payment is received. All right, and then we also do send out regular newsletters to keep mums and dads up to date with the latest development from research, clinical trials, and where stem cells have been used. All right, and then just lastly, just to mention um, that NetCells is an, an internationally accredited, accredited South African laboratory um, who is a Discovery's preferred provider. So there are benefits. If you are a Discovery member, there are certain um, discounts that you, you would get. And I uh, thank you for your time. Good night. <laughs> thank you, Sister Bonwin. We appreciate your time given and your information. It's very, it's very important. I mean, none of us know the in-depth things. It's, we just know that it's a good thing to do. So it's great to find out why it's a good thing to do. So thank you. It's absolutely okay. pleasure. So our next speaker, a video, is Dr. Serena H. Chen. Dr. Chen can't be live with us today as she is busy dispensing COVID-19 vaccines to her patients in New Jersey, USA. So she recorded this video to give her perspective on taking the vaccine whilst pregnant or trying to conceive. Now, just a quick note, if the video doesn't play well for you, it will be available on our YouTube channel tomorrow. Could you see the video? Dr. Tato, could you see the video? I was told it wasn't playing. The video is not playing. It wasn't playing your side. No, it's okay. not playing. Let me try that again. Don't we just love technical issues? Mm. Let's try it this way. Okay. Hello, so great to be here at IVF Babel. My name is Serena H. Chen. I'm a physician. Uh, I do reproductive medicine, in vitro fertilization, egg freezing, all those kinds of things in the United States and New Jersey. And I'm here to talk with you about the COVID-19 vaccine. So right now in the United States, uh, we have two vaccines that have been approved and those are both messenger RNA vaccines. They are under emergency use authorization by the FDA, so it's not full FDA approval, but the FDA feels that during the pandemic, these are there's enough data to feel that these vaccines are effective and safe. Um, they're both messenger RNA, and but you know, if you're here at IVF Babel, you're probably thinking about your eggs, your sperm, you're thinking about um, your fertility, you might be pregnant. And all of those are concerns when it comes to new medications and things like that. So I did want to talk with you about that. And there's recently been a lot of kind of controversy and confusion um, because the WHO came out with a statement in January saying maybe not all pregnant women should get the vaccine, but in the United States, 
all of our societies and authorities and experts are actually on the same page. Um, our CDC, the FDA, um, our advisory committee on an, an immunizations to the CDC, ACIP, and then all of our women's health experts, the American College of OBGYN, ACOG, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, SMFM, and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Um, that's people like me, all the in vitro fertilization doctors across the country, all very strongly have been on the same page since you know, back in December when these um, vaccines got emergency use authorization, that given the pandemic and the, the risks of COVID-19, it seems that for the messenger RNA vaccines, that the benefits of getting vaccinated far outweigh the risks of getting vaccinated and any theoretic risks. Now, why is that? Um, so first of all, the messenger RNA vaccines, the one by Pfizer and the vaccine by Moderna, those are both approved in the United States. Um, they are both messenger RNA vaccines. So they're actually quite similar. They're, they're um, a, a little segment of messenger RNA, which is code to help your cells make protein. It's packaged in a little lipid package and it's put in an injection and it's injected into your deltoid muscle. So when you get this injection, the um, lipid allows um, these, the lipid particles attached to the cells and it just merge with the cells and that allows delivery of the messenger RNA into your cells. Now, the messenger RNA is a code and your cells are a little factory. They're essentially protein factories. So as soon as like a piece of messenger RNA comes in, the pieces of the factory all gather together around the messenger RNA and that is ribosomes and transfer RNA and they put the code together and they make protein. And in the case of these vaccines, they're making a piece of the spike protein of the coronavirus. So it's not the whole virus. This is not live virus. It's not attenuated virus. It's not killed virus. There are some vaccines that are being developed that are like that, but this is only messenger RNA. So it codes for a little piece of the spike protein. The spike protein is what the coronavirus uses to attach to the lung cells and other cells in your body that allows the virus to get inside your body and cause a big infection. So this is only a very small part of uh, a pro the, coro uh, the coronavirus spike protein. So the messenger RNA goes into your cells, it goes into your cytoplasm only, it does not go into the nucleus, it does not change your DNA or your genetics, uh, your your cells make this pro piece of protein. This protein then gets um, um, presented by your cells to the rest of the body, and your immune system recognizes the spike protein as not human, as foreign. And then your immune system activates, and you make um, you activate B cells and T cells, and the B cells make antibody against the spike protein. And they, apparently they make all different kinds of antibodies, like multiple different kinds of antibodies. And then T cells are also activated um, to, to do their kind of thing. Now I have to say, I don't understand that part very well. I am a vagina doctor, okay? A reproductive endocrinologist trained in OBGYN. I am not a virologist, but um, I know T cells also are responsible for immunity. T cells are not talked about so much because T cell immunity is very difficult to measure. So we don't actually know a ton about it, but we do know these vaccines are extremely effective in their trials. And that's part of why they were approved. And they also seem to have a very good safety profile, both of them. So um, what about pregnant women? Well, American College of OBGYN fought very, very hard to try to get pregnant women into the trial. And just like a lot of other things in women's healthcare, 
uh, we didn't really get what we wanted. Um, unfortunately, pregnant women were excluded from the trials. And that kind of leaves us in this weird catch-22 where, you know, uh, we're excluded from the trials. So people say, well, we don't have any data in pregnant women. Well, there's like no way to get data because we're excluded from the trials. So um, anyway, ACOG and ASRM and the CDC and the FDA and ACIP all are on the same page because they know we have the known risk. So even though we don't have a study in pregnant women saying that the vaccine is safe, we do know a lot about the physiology of pregnancy. We know a lot about the physiology of our bodies. We know a lot about the physiology of messenger RNA, and we have pregnancy trials in animals. And all of those things have so far been very reassuring, and we don't think it's likely at all that we're gonna, there's going to be some crazy uh, issues with the vaccine. Now, having said that, we have to put this all in context because it's always about a risk-benefit ratio. So the risks of not getting the vaccine are huge. We're in a pandemic. The virus is mutating like wildfire. People are getting infected thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people getting infected every day all around the world. People are dying and pregnant women especially should be normally young and healthy. We're in the young and healthy group and those should be low risk for dying from COVID while pregnancy takes you from a low risk group and puts you automatically into a high risk group. Pregnant women are at much higher risk of getting severe COVID. They're much higher risk of ending up in the hospital. They're much higher risk of ending up intubated on a ventilator. They are much, they are at much higher risk of dying. And so knowing that for certain that COVID is spreading like crazy around the world, that we have a global pandemic and that people are dying, including pregnant women every day, we know pregnancy puts you at great risk for COVID. All the American experts and societies all agree that the benefits of the vaccine for pregnant women, women trying to conceive and women lactating and men trying to conceive far outweighs the risk, the theoretic risk of the vaccine. Um, we are collecting data on pregnant women. So uh, the CDC, um, through their new vSafe app, has already, you know, there's already been tens of thousands of pregnant women, over 10,000 pregnant women, maybe like close to 20,000, hopefully soon, uh, have been vaccinated with the messenger RNA vaccines. And so we will have significant data soon. So far, nothing crazy has happened, but obviously we're going to track it. So talk to your doctor, it, uh, ACOG and the CDC and the FDA and ASRM are not saying you have to get the vaccine, but they are saying pregnant women should not be restricted from access to the vaccine. So if it's time for you to get the vaccine and you're pregnant or you're trying to conceive and you want to get it, you should not be prevented from getting it just because you're pregnant. And women should not have to take a pregnancy test before they get the vaccine. That's very strong wording from them. Now, the WHO was kind of a little waffly last week about it. They were saying, oh, only only women, they were very confusing because they said women at only women at high, only pregnant women at high risk should get the vaccine. And then they said only healthcare workers. Well, obviously there are a lot of other women other than healthcare workers who are at high risk of getting COVID-19. And in fact, since pregnancy itself makes you high risk from dying from COVID-19, doesn't that kind of make all pregnant women high risk? So there was a huge outcry all around the world because the WHO was super confusing and everybody was confused and it created more vaccine hesitancy really at a time when that's the last thing that we need. We need people to feel comfortable taking the vaccine because that is our way out of this pandemic. A lot of the mutations are arising because the virus is spreading so rapidly. This virus does not actually mutate at a rate 
as fast as the flu. But because so many millions of people are infected, every time the virus gets in, uh, infects another person, it's a, another mechanism for the virus to mutate. So we're seeing all these variants and these variants potentially are a huge risk. So we really need to try to get as many people vaccinated as we possibly can, including pregnant women. Now, if you don't wanna get the vaccine, you don't have to, but I would say that if you're at risk of getting COVID-19, if you cannot completely and totally shelter in place and prevent contact with anybody who might have COVID-19 and you have a chance to get the vaccine, please do think about it. Please check out ivfbabble.com. There's a lot of great information there. We have information on our site, irms.com. Uh, follow me on Instagram, dr. Dr. Serena H. Chen. Um, on Instagram and Twitter. I'm trying to put out information as we learn it about the vaccine. So hopefully learn about the vaccine, figure out what your individual pros and cons are, talk to your doctor. In the United States, we are not restricting the vaccine to pregnant women. We're obviously trying to roll it out in stages because of vaccine supply issues, but pregnancy should not be a barrier pregnancy itself or trying to conceive for men or women or lactation, breastfeeding should not by itself prevent you from getting the vaccine. You might decide that in your particular situation, you don't want to get it right now. That's okay, but make an informed decision. Talk with your doctor. Uh, the benefits of the vaccine seem to dramatically outweigh the risks of getting COVID-19 for most people, including pregnant women. I hope this is helpful to you. Um, have a great day. Keep wearing your mask, keep washing your hands, and stay safe. Take care. Bye. I hear that some people saw her face with a black <clears throat> mark in front of it. I apologize. She's not trying to stay anonymous. Um, it looked fine my side. So we will upload the video to our YouTube channel tomorrow and you can see her pretty face. Otherwise, make sure that you do follow her on Instagram and Twitter. She does give it out a lot of information. There's also a statement released by the European Society of Human Reproduction and Embryology just yesterday on this topic too. So also go and have a look and a read on their website, www.eshre.eu. Okay, so there are a few questions. I think some of them have been answered, um, but we will go through them. They will, I'll go through the ones that have been answered so people can hear the answers in case they have the same questions. Dr. Tato, if we are both COVID negative, will my husband be able to attend the birth? Dr. Tato said definitely, but you must have negative results that are less than 48 hours old. Um, Sister Bronwyn, is the collection painful for my baby or is the collection taken once the cord has been cut? Um, that was answer two, not at all. The doctor will clamp and cut the cord after which the collection is done. There's no pain for mom or your baby. And then, ooh. <laughs> Sister Bronwyn, you can answer that one. What is the difference between embryonic and adult stem cells? <laughs> Most definitely. All right. Hi there. Okay. So embryonic stem cells is something we do not do. <laughs> okay. So an embryo, remember, is a growing little person inside your uterus. Okay. So we will never, ever, ever derive stem cells from a growing little somebody. Okay. Um, all right. So basically, I think I'm going to answer your question with the fact that we're talking about umbilical cord blood stem cells as opposed to adult stem cells. Okay. And adult stem cells will be stem cells that we get from you or me as, as, as adults, and those come out of your bone marrow or out of blood, peripheral blood. And, and there's a whole process that, that, that one would go through where we have to put you on certain medications, which then sort of does suppress your immunity, stimulates the bone marrow, and stem cells will then be harvested that way. All right. As mentioned in my talk earlier, those stem cells are older. And they've been through life. Okay, they've had every cigarette that you've smoked. They've ever had every glass of wine that you've had. They've ever had virus that you've been exposed to. So they are, um, you know, they are more mature and less uh, resilient to the uses for for what we would use stem cell treatment for. 
And that is why it's so exciting that we can use the take stem cells from little oneies that are just born because ordinarily they would either be thrown away. Okay, cord is cut off, placenta is put in a bag and put in a freezer and then eventually gets burnt or buried. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so that's basically the difference. So um, yeah, so cord blood stem cells are nice and new and fresh and able to be manipulated um, by the body and the body's so clever. The body will recognize those stem cells and take them to the place where they need to be used. Um, but the science and, and the, the understanding of what these stem cells can actually do still is hugely unknown. So it's an exciting science and an innovative science. And we know that maybe 10 years hence, we can do so much with these stem cells. And I mean, it's, it's not widely publicized, but we know that I mentioned just now that the mesenchymal stem cells are those which help to regenerate tissue. And, you know, with COVID so, so topical is that there are studies to show that even stem cells can be used to help repair those lungs that get so badly damaged from, from COVID. So, you know, we wouldn't be able to use the stem cells that are born right now to treat COVID of the mommy that is positive, for example. But we know, hence, going forward to treat chronic illness as, a, as a caused by a very bad COVID infection, we know the potential for use is there. Okay, so there we are. No embryonic stem cells. See. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Robin. Dr. Tato, what is the scan procedure at the hospital during these times? I presume that these people will be COVID negative. Yes, yeah, so in COVID negative patients, we basically follow normal antenatal care procedures. So obviously we take precautions, they screening getting into the hospital and most practices actually have screening getting into the practice. However, once you go through that screening, the um, ultrasound scanning is, is as if um, there was no COVID basically. Okay, great. And will my baby be tested for COVID if I'm positive? And when will my baby, baby be tested? That is actually a very good question. So yes, in COVID positive patients, um, uh, the pediatrician actually um, uh, treats the baby as a patient under investigation or to call PUIs. So they test the baby after 24 hours because obviously if you test the baby before 24 hours, it means that the baby got the infection while in utero. And um, as we said, evidence shows that, that that doesn't really happen. So they test after 24 hours. So it means um, for at least 48 hours, you won't see your baby because if that test is negative, they're still going to keep your baby and test after another 24 hours, which would mean the baby is now 48 hours old uh, before you see your baby, before you're with your baby is very unfortunate yep okay um dr tato or this is directed to you but i think also sister bronwyn we've heard about the collection of stem cells at birth but what if the baby has covid how does that affect the stem cells i think it I does let... not <laughs> okay you, you first <laughs> all right um it doesn't affect the stem cells at all Okay, so we can safely collect. We do, I mean, we do um, take note of the fact that mom tested positive for COVID at the time. Um, it's just important for clarity for transplant later on. So, you know, the transplant preps, if those stem cells are used eventually, may only happen in 20 years' time. But there will be documentation accompanying that stem cell the, a sample, which is released to indicate that there was COVID um, infection at the time. But it does not um, yield the stem cells useless. They will still be very valuable and they can still be used. And not, not to say the baby had COVID. Indeed. At, at, yeah, at birth, the, the chances that the baby has COVID is quite low. It's very small. Hmm. Okay, perfect. Then there are a few questions about the vaccine. Um, if you can email them to me, I can put them to Dr. Chen. Um, my email address is saskia at ifasa, I-F-A-A-S-A dot C-A dot Z-A. If you send me those questions about the vaccine, I'll get Dr. Serena Chen to answer them. That's it for tonight. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you to Dr. Tato, Sister Rousseau. Thank you so much for giving your time this evening. Uh, we do really appreciate it. And, and I'm sure everybody that's watching and has learned a thing or two as well. So Wonderful. thank you. Thank you so I, much. Before you go, I'd like to thank you, Saskia. I think these are, are quite important. Um, and 
I was part of last year's one, and I think uh, slowly but surely, you are winning. I see. Yeah. I'm seeing a change, so that's that's good. So we'll keep at it. Perfect. <laughs> we will. We'll keep fighting the fight. Keep fighting. The fight. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Starter. Thank you, Sister Bronwyn. Thank Have you. Good, good night. Stay you safe. Too. Bye. Bye, -bye.